yeah how's it going <laughs> very well thank you i mean like i was saying before this is honestly an amazing opportunity like i remember watching your videos i mean it must be like what four or five years ago now lucid dreaming videos like oh yeah that, that honestly that got me into the whole spirit spirituality thing like learning how to lucid dream as a kid like it was honestly a mini awakening within itself and genuinely i think you were the root reason to that which is no way quite a weird experience like, <laughs> that's so cool yeah I, I feel like lucid dreaming is kind of like a gateway into deeper stuff like spirituality and consciousness because it, it makes you ask more questions you know you you want to know more about like reality consciousness how we hear how does it all work and like the, it opens up to the big questions i think but yeah it's cool that you used to watch my my videos and now you have a tiktok and your following is yeah. bigger than mine <laughs> you're like yeah. i think you have like 70 uh, something k and yeah, mine's like mine's at 40 reach 70k in the space of like a month now which is very weird i mean i've been doing tiktok since um february but yeah. it hasn't been since April that it's just exploded off from one video that I posted about a collective consciousness. <laughs> off of one video, really? Yeah, yeah. It hit a million wow. views and then from then I've just been racking it up. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm curious, actually, what, what, how often do you actually project and, um, and how do you think it differs from Lucid Dream? Because I feel like they are definitely different, but I'm just curious about your opinions on it. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. I think with astral projection, it's certainly more difficult. Like, I feel like it's way more difficult than lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming, I can do comfortably several times a month if I try and do it several times a week, depending on, like, how much I want to interrupt my sleep. Because if you do certain techniques, like wake back to bed, you interrupt your sleep and then you feel tired the next day, but you get, it's, like, more likely that you'll lucid dream. With astral projection, it's very, for me at least, it's very difficult and it's very rare. I've only done it, like, a, hand, a small handful of times and then there's been a few more times which I'm not 100% sure it was astral projection because it was kind of in that in-between state. But to be honest, those few times were enough to make me massively interested in it. Like I became obsessed with learning about consciousness and reality. And yeah, I, I guess my downfall is I love information. So I, I feel like I focus too much on learning and reading about stuff and not enough time on practicing it. Or at least not as much as I should, but... And so, yeah, no. sorry, the differences. So the differences are with lucid dreaming. But again, the, the lines are quite blurred. But with lucid dreaming, it's theoretically all in your mind, or at least mostly in your mind. Even that, we're starting to realise now, um, there's... And there's different theories about this, but we're starting to think to see that the lines are kind of blurred. Like, things that happen in a dream can kind of influence and interact with real things outside the dream. And there's all kinds of stories about shared dreaming and... Uh, premonitions, precognitive dreams, past life regression through lucid lucid states and all this kind of stuff. So I, I'm amazed at how little we know. And maybe you've um, kind of felt the same thing. It's like the more you research something, the more you realise how much we don't know and like how incredible it all is. And there's just so many different rabbit holes you can go down. 100%. I mean, the difference between lucid dreaming and astral projection is so crazy. I mean, in, in my experience, I've lucid dreams like quite a few times, but like you say, astral projection, I've literally had one experience of it and it was like yeah. just almost the part of leaving my body out. I wasn't even able to fully like travel around, travel around so to speak. It, it was just the, you know, almost like I was being lifted out of my body flying through my ceiling. But that in and of itself felt so different to lucid dreaming. It was almost like a completely different experience. Because a lot of people are like, oh, maybe astral projection just you having a lucid dream and you imagining astral projecting it in the lucid dreaming but i say to them like this experience of astral projection is so almost a different feeling like the vibration of you actually ascending mm. from your body is almost so real more than real in a way isn't it and it's mind-boggling coming back to reality and being like what the hell was that how do i explain that in normal terms yeah no absolutely the the crazy thing is because i've heard i've heard many people talk about like oh it's just lucid dreaming or it's like it's just you're just sleeping or dreaming it thing is my main astral projection experience so like the one i remember the most clearly was when i was wide awake like i was literally in my bunk bed fully awake and i was quite young i was maybe like 10 12 something like that fully awake and then i looked down at the floor and then the next thing i know i'm literally like flying across the top of a forest you know like have you ever seen wingsuit diving videos yeah 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 where they kind of like saw down uh, they kind of like glide down a mountain mountain range. So it was yeah. literally like that. And I was freaking out because I, I didn't know whether I was hallucinating or whether I was like asleep. But I was wide awake holding the bed, literally like this. 
And when I came out of the vision, I ran downstairs and I was like, what the hell just happened? I was like really confused. So for, at, least for, at least for that one, like there's no doubt that was astral projection because I was awake, you know, like I wasn't even dreaming or sleeping. 100%. I mean, dreams honestly just make you completely question reality. I mean, one of the biggest things that I took from dreams was when you're in a dream, your mind separates yourself from the external environment within the dream, so you feel separate from it. But it's not until you wake up that you're like, oh wait, I was everyone in that dream and they were my projections and beliefs. And I feel like that's mm. you know, linked to how when we die, we're gonna come back and be like, oh, in this reality, everyone else was our projections and dreams. Like it's all, almost, not in a um, solipsistic type of way, but everyone has their own individualistic reality that we can control and manipulate and dreams wake you up to that. And I feel like psychedelics do as well. Like the, the mini ego death, like it, it puts you in a state of, of dying and reveals that spiritual awakening to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so an interesting thing with that is if you heard about the, the egg theory where the whole universe is an egg and we, uh, we are basically the same life force interacting with each other. Definitely. There's a, there's a great, is it Perkazag? Her, they have a YouTube channel on that, um, and it's an amazing video on that. Um, I think I've got I've posted a video on my TikTok actually about that. But yeah, I love that theory um, about how we are everyone, including you know Jesus and Hitler. We're, we're both mm. sides of it. We're, you know, we are both the God and the Devil in one. Like, yeah. But then you get into the questions of determinism and karma and free will, and these are like. I feel like these are insanely complicated topics. 100%. You know? And, and there so really is no definitive answer, is there? Which is why I think it's so interesting to discuss. Yeah. Like, no one knows the actual absolute truth to it all. It's just open for discussion. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. So, like, what do, you th what do you think about karmic laws, for example? So, like, like what we were saying with um, everyone being connected as one um, life force, like the egg theory. I feel like the best way like for karma to work um, and the fairest way is if you, everyone, and you're and, uh, at some point in your life experience everyone's life, every bad thing you do to someone, you then experience that bad thing. So it's almost like an intrinsic karma in of itself because the only bad things you're doing is to yourself and you then feel that pain when you experience that life after this life because, you, you know, you're the, all, you're the one God that's connected experience mm. yeah exactly i think that's i think that's how it probably works but it gets confusing when you think about by by incarnating or like by being born in this world you you have to create karma in one way or another so I, d I don't think it's possible to go through life without creating any sort of karma so then the question is like if you're forced to create karma both good or bad then is it really a free choice is it really free will because the karma, so I've heard in, in many different like spiritual uh, texts, they say that it's karma that keeps you reincarnating. So because you have a karmic debt, you have to reincarnate to then like pay off that debt or experience the rewards of good karma or something like that. But then if you, ha if you have to create karma when you're born, then you'll be kind of like forced to reincarnate to then pay off that debt. So then where's the free, where does free will play into that? 100%. I mean, I think... I feel like that's um, also linked to the the story of Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve in Christianity as well. You know, mm. the the choice to take the apple to choose the knowledge between good and evil. You know, suffering. I feel like was a choice. When when um, I know I'm talking metaphysically here, but say we were you know godlike before we came to this life, we were omnipotent and had full power. I feel like we chose to then come down here, choosing to know the difference between good and evil, choosing to have suffering in our lives to enable us to progress throughout I feel like because I feel like karma like you're saying is a choice it, it is suffering but you you, cho you choose to do it so that you can know the other side almost mm. yeah that's an that's an interesting idea actually yeah because by having the choice of good and evil then it's more valuable when you choose the good and then when you choose the bad you in theory would get karmically kind of punished for that so you learn the lesson to not choose that in in the next like lifetime or next time definitely and and Without the binary opposition of good and bad, there wouldn't be a good and bad anyway. Like that's the, yeah. it's like the dualism within the world, isn't it? Like we need there to be the suffering in order to reap the rewards of happiness. So an interesting, yeah, exactly. An interesting rabbit hole I've been down is looking into, I don't know how much I can say that will be allowed on YouTube. I'll try and keep it basic. But if you assume that there's a kind of structure in the world of 
elite people or like groups of people institutions and collaborations that make certain things happen like certain agendas and everything like that the rabbit hole is that what if those are necessary to create a perfectly balanced world with just as much good as bad and so that when let's say the scales tip too far in one direction and the world starts turning really good on average then these elite kind of groups would make certain things happen to bring it back into balance so that there's always a perfectly balanced choice between good or evil do you know what i mean whereas compared to like if the world was just chaotic all the time or if the world was just bliss all the time then it's not really a free will choice between good or bad because it's already in that state 100 percent. no i i agree with you i mean i'd even go as far as saying that maybe it's not even the elites on our world it's potentially even elites like alien worlds coming in and yeah like, trying to control us because they they've been there they've done that they know how to get us that level of consciousness and if that class suffering is necessary in our society then maybe that is the way it needs to go because as bad as things is in our society like you can almost escape the matrix of the society and choose mm. to do good. like even though it is hard yeah no 100 percent. there's also uh, an even further rabbit hole where let's say if you assume there's groups or people that make things balanced on earth whether that's doing good or bad things and then but then they're actually kind of controlled or like the 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 strings are being pulled by extraterrestrial or higher intelligent beings the rabbit hole that i went down shows that those those extraterrestrials or those advanced beings could actually be us in the future who are then reaching back through the timeline to then help guide the earlier version of themselves to, but I mean, it gets really trippy. Like when you start talking about timelines, I wish I knew everything about timelines, like everything. I mean, that that stuff, especially because it's so like unfalsifiable and philosophical, and no, so many different ways of that time travel can go. Because you know, obviously, we can't experience it properly. It's hard to know what, what how it works in a way. Um, but I definitely agree that there is some sort, of, especially when you look at past human evolution. I feel like it makes sense that aliens. If, um, cause if, <laughs> if aliens come down and see us, they're going to want to accelerate evolution because they, mm. they know that this is them, you know, um, a billion years in the past. Like that, I feel like that would make sense to advanced civilization and then to, you know, keep an eye on us, make sure we're going in the right direction. And if it, that does then turn out that that is them from the past and it's a circular time loop, then maybe, but honestly, I'd, I don't know much and science of, the, of time continuum to to stay whether it is true or not <laughs> yeah for sure that's actually an, another interesting kind of topic is that if you look around uh, ancient history you can see that different civilizations on different continents had very very similar building structures like for example with pyramids and with those kind of uh, I forgot what they're called now the ob- maybe they're obelisks or something you can even see them in Washington now and like various other places where it's like a long pillar with a small pyramid on top right. and uh, yeah there's this theory that it was actually higher beings or like extraterrestrials that came and influenced or helped build those things. And they had a crazy, like really advanced civilization. And then every few thousand years, like I think it's every 2,100 years, the cycle, if you will, it kind of gets reset. And then the civilization or the level of technology gets brought back down to like a really basic level. And then and then it builds up again, almost like um, like a farmer kind of harvesting their crop and then they reduce it back to nothing and then it has to grow up again because uh yeah i mean whoever built the pyramids was either an interdimensional kind of demigod or they had knowledge of advanced electrical power magnetism stuff that we don't even have now i mean because i, think, uh, um, I don't know if you heard of uh, graham hancock yeah yeah yeah, yeah. He, he says it best about um human history has a, a sort of amnesia like there is parts of human history that because it was so in the past that we just don't know about. But like I say, when you look at pyramids and the, the exact coordinates to the speed of light, like to the decimal place, yeah. uh, there, there's just no way that ancient humans, unless they were evolved in a more uh, way that was more intelligent or they had alien help, there was no way they did it just from our level of intelligence. There was some other source of external help going on, definitely in our human history. Of course, yeah. The funniest thing is when I, you see these explanations of how they're supposed to have built the pyramids and there, it'll be an animation of like these slaves rolling bricks or like rolling the, the stone blocks on logs. And you think like these things weighed several tons, like some of them weighed a lot and there's no way you could roll those on logs. Like you would have to have immense physical strength Literally. and a lot of time. <laughs> 
Hundred percent. I, I think um, it was Graham Hancock again that said that in order for because the pyramid is so big, in order for them to have um, a ramp that takes the rocks or however they were getting the things up there, the gradient of that would be so long that it would still be here to this day. This um, sand ramp that they built, but yet there's nothing like that. Like we, we just, honestly just don't know how their precision was so good. It's mind. Yeah. No, and that's the thing. So I think I saw that clip actually of Graham Hancock talking about the ramp. And the, the gradient it would have had to have been. But even that wouldn't explain how they managed to cut perfectly chiseled like channels all the way through with no tool marks, no kind of evidence of how they did it. They placed the blocks and then they seem to like, they, it seems like they cut the channel after they placed the blocks in there. So how on earth would they have done that? And it's like laser precision. Literally. It literally and is. perfectly, perfectly aligned to certain constellations, which they were supposed to not even know about or like they they shouldn't have been able to calculate that well, all these ancient civilizations at the same time all in the yeah. line of longitude around like they just knew somehow they knew something <laughs> yeah oh, i love i love the pyramids um egyptian stuff in fact i saw one thing the other day that said there was apparently no there have been no hieroglyphs found on the inside of the great pyramid and no pharaohs have been found inside the Great Pyramid, because they say that, they try and say that like, it was a, a tomb for the pharaohs. And I think some of the other pyramids were, but the Great Pyramid, which is the really unique one, apparently no hieroglyphs and no pharaohs inside. Oh yeah, I wonder why that is. Yeah, I mean, that would suggest that it was older than the Egyptian cult, the, the, than the Egyptian civilization. Yeah. Maybe they found it and kind of used it. Yeah, no, that is crazy. I do have a, a question I'd like to bring up. What Go on. What is your opinion, uh, opinion on, um, on religion, on uh, on God, like oh. an Abrahamic God. Any opinions? Abrahamic God. I th well, this is another. This is a a big topic. So the Abrahamic God, from what I can see, is what I would consider to be like a negative entity. And I think that the major religions around the world were massively influenced at certain times by. And so with the Abrahamic religions, they all seem to have come from like the same kind of seed. Yeah. And if you notice in Let's take the, Bible, the Christian Bible, for example. If you notice in the Old Testament versus the New Testament, it's almost like com two completely different gods or two, com two completely different personalities. They seem to be the absolute opposite of each other. And if you look at the things the Old Testament God says in the Bible, they're very strange. Very like It's very questionable for an, supposedly an all-loving, all-knowing God that it makes you think, how does that... It, it, it almost doesn't make sense. But then if you look, if you compare that to the other gods of the time, and then you get into like symbolism and you look at the different types of like fish deities. And if, I don't know if you've looked into like the different symbolism across the different religions throughout history, but you can see a, a remarkable amount of sim similarity between the different deities. Specifically, if you look into things like any uh, links or relations to Saturn, to uh, fish deities or fish gods, anything involving like sacrifice and consuming blood I and mean, even now right even in the um uh, i believe catholic christianity they still do that kind of ceremony and the symbolism there is, is still the same with the, the kind of like the fish deities and uh, even to the point where the pope wears the hat the exact same hat which is in the symbolism from ancient history showing the fish god which i mean it, it's a huge rabbit hole but yeah i think organized religion is very very different to open-minded spirituality focused on a higher power or source creation energy i think they're very different 100 percent. i mean people like Karl marx and like we've known that organized religion has just been used for corruption it is an absolute hmm. you know population power tool like it keeps it keeps you in line and it because I, I, one of the biggest myths I feel like religion teaches us is that heaven and all the good stuff, eternal life, all the best things you're going to receive happens when you die and that you're not in heaven right now. Like, it, it, I feel, and it doesn't let like you live in the present. It always thinks, oh, I'm going to get there. You know, when I die, I'm going to, I'm going to be living happily ever after. Yeah, you know, and you forget that this is heaven right now. Like, there's, there's nothing after your death. You come, you come back here, you reincarnate. And like, it's, this is mm. heaven. And that's the lie that they're this, you know, telling us all that this isn't heaven. Have you looked into the Gnostic Gospels? I, I've heard um, some bits about it. I did religious studies in like AL, so I've, I've heard some stuff. But go on, t tell me some, some stuff about them. Right. So if, if you assume that the, so the main Christian canon Bible 
that, that, that exists today. That was massively censored and edited hundreds of years ago. And I forget the exact date, but there's, I have it in my notes somewhere, there's a specific meeting that happened where they basically agreed on bit like changes they were going to make to the Bible. And then from that point on, they just said, right, from now on, the Bibles will all be written exactly like this. No changes, no, no whatever. So, uh, referred to the Council of Nicaea? That's the one, yeah. Council Thank you, yeah, the Council. 325, I believe. Um, but yeah, they, they changed the definitions to um, things like the Trinity um, and things like that, like um, all, all things like uh, Jesus' return and stuff as an aid to, you know, keep them in control of the population yeah uh, and they knew that, that i mean i guess they were smart and <laughs> and you know figured out a way to do that but yeah now it's completely insane what's happened with it yeah so a couple of the interesting things that, that were changed were they removed some of the gnostic gospels specifically like the gospel i think it was the gospel of thomas and then the gospel of mary and then there was also a couple of other ones where they had direct quotes from supposedly what Jesus said, that these quotes were very different to what you'll find in the Bible today. And an, an example I can uh, think of is like the word Elohim. Elohim means, uh, supposedly in, in the Bible, it means God, right? But if you look at the definition, it actually means the mighty ones or the, you know, the, the gods plural. It doesn't mean just one God, it means the mighty ones. And that's just one example of like how the, the, the way we think it works is so different from the actual truth. And I feel like we were only seeing a tiny part of the actual truth of reality. 100%. I mean, um, I, I believe I'm right in saying this. I think um, the gospel, it's um, infancy gospel of Thomas and Jesus in that story, it's, it's his childhood um, till um, when he's an adult and he literally kills someone in this story. But and then because he killed someone, they took it out because they felt it was a, not a reflection of Jesus. But um, in this account of a disciple, um, Jesus kills someone so yeah um, mm. yeah it is, it is very interesting what you're saying about um, Elohim and that being plural because it, it does just prove that you know back in the day the change from polytheistic to now monotheistic um, and, and then just all the there's 33,000 denominations of Christianity does that not just show that clearly there's some sort of thing going wrong between what how they get their truth like when there's that many dispersion of beliefs within that one religion like it's crazy and and not just that so like you say there's 33,000 denominations of christianity there's also dozens of versions of this of the main stories in the bible like for example the flood story that's not the only version of that story like hundreds of years before there were other versions of that that tell it in a similar way but with slightly different details Epical and yeah, that's an example, right? The Epic of Gilgamesh. My point is, there's different versions of this story. The flood, the Bible flood story is just one of them. And the same as the creation story. I need. To, I wish I knew everything about this stuff, literally. <laughs> and it would be so cool. <laughs> it's an unlimited rabbit hole to dive into. <laughs> have you heard about the, the holographic universe? Have you read that book? I have not. I have not. So this guy basically summarised a few studies that have been done recently that show the world is essentially a hologram. So with a hologram, every piece of the hologram has a copy of the entire image. And so the idea is that in every tiny atom of our existence, inside that atom is the key or like the map of everything else in existence. And okay. uh, yeah, interestingly, like modern quantum mechanics, and quantum physics has apparently shown that if you take away the empty space in between atoms or in between uh, electrons or protons and then shrunk everything down, everything would fit into a grain of sand. And uh, so, yeah, I find that really interesting. And I've seen comparisons of like th small things in nature compared to massive things. Like for example, like uh, your eye compared to the structure of a universe and it's very similar. And then if you look as well at like the structure of um, a galaxy compared to the structure, the, um, the way our neurons in our brain create different synaptic maps, they look almost identical. Like the way they form these patterns and then even on the, in the middle ground, like the way we build our cities, if you look at a, a picture of a city at night from above, like from a satellite image, the way we spread out naturally forms the same kind of pattern as our, the neurons in our brain and how galaxies are formed. So it's like no matter how far in you look or how far out you look, we're following the same kind of template of creation. As above, which, so below. Hologram, right? Yeah, as above, so below, exactly. That's And that's, again, that idea is all over the ancient spiritual texts. It's in like 
every religion, every spiritual and historical uh, text, they seem to have like their their version of that as above, so below. So what does it all mean? <laughs> Definitely, it is honestly crazy. I mean, the fact, the fact that, the way I look at it is the fact that the universe almost has this line of progression, like the way that we're evolving, the, uh, the way that it um, has intrinsic patterns set in the universe shows me that there's explicit meaning within the universe. So there's explicit, you know, direction that we're heading to, you know, whether that's you know, humanity's ascension, whether that's, you know, the unity of everyone. I feel like there is, you know, a direction of evolution that we need to push through and not even actively need to push through because I think the universe is going to do it for us and we're just here for the ride almost in a way. Mm. Yeah, the question is, if there's a direction we're going in as a, as a species or as a, I guess, as a whole universe, are we here to experience that kind of like the observer and everything's determined, everything is like destined to happen exactly how it's going to happen? Or are we here to create or change that outcome? like using our free will to actually create something we want to experience. I'm really curious about that. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. Um, I feel like with the, the determinism and, and free will debate, I feel like there's not a set answer because everyone's level of free will is varied. Um, mm. I feel like um, depending on your level of consciousness, the factors of determinism, you know, decrease or increase. So if you've got a high level of consciousness, you have more capacity for free will. If you have a low level of consciousness, you are more inclined to deterministic factors and therefore you have a set destiny. Um, and I feel like, you know, our, our goal in life is to be the observer of um, the input that's coming into us, the deterministic factors, and then making that self-aware choice to have the free will to act against those deterministic factors. And then by developing that scale of choice through, you know, increasing our level of consciousness, we become more free will, you know, enlightened. And, and yeah, I feel like that is the path that we should do. But for to answer the question, I feel like, yeah, um, there is a variety of free will within everyone. Mm. I like when you, what you said about how your level of free will is linked to your level of consciousness. Would you do you think that it's also linked to our level of intelligence? And then how does that play into like transhumanism or blending with AI? Yeah, very, this is a very tricky debate. Yeah, and no, that is true because mm. my 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 sh struggle is I'm not sure if we were to implement um, technology into humans and transhumanism was the direction we're going in. Because we're natural and our thoughts and come from the universe, is that then the logical next step of natural evolution? Or do we avoid that and stick to, you know, just being humans and see where that takes us, but it might be slower. So I'm, I'm honestly divided. I, I don't know what would be the better route. Yeah. So I th for me, I think what it is, is there's this collective consciousness that we're all that we can all tap into which is infinite and i think that's kind of that's i think where we should be focusing on but then so when you, you then go to transhumanism or ai usually that means that the ai technology has been created by a small group of people sometimes even a handful of humans and if their agendas or interests are, are not good then it becomes very dangerous because they're essentially dictating the way you think and this is a problem i think with a lot of um social media and search engine algorithms is they algorithmically get to determine they get to like kind of guide our thoughts and our thought processes even like with google auto suggest they alter the things that they suggest to you which then alters the way you think about what should i search for how should i ask questions what topics should i focus on and then by definition the ones they don't suggest are the ones you kind of avoid or you don't think to look and look them up and it's like suddenly an algorithm is determining what we actually the way we think instead of connecting individually to source and collective intelligence which i think that is the key to evolution i think transhumanism it could be used for good but i think it's also there's a big danger with that definitely no you are right especially with the way things are going when you look at the metaverse and that's how it's all monopolized with one company like yeah no if that <laughs> if that technology were to get in the wrong hands it definitely would not look good for humanity and and like say the element of free meal would probably be completely diminished because you'd be completely controlled by you know the 1984 robots <laughs> yeah the thought police the ministry of truth yeah. i'll tell you what though the one if i was going to use a metaverse like walk around in a metaverse the last one i would want to do would be the facebook one like oh, yeah. having mark zuckerberg in control of my virtual reality <laughs> would be a nightmare yeah <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, the scary thing is that honestly there might be no escape from it in our society. Like it, it could mm. just be implemented as like this is the standard way we work now. Like, I mean, no one could stop phones being such a utilised part in society. No one could stop the internet. You know, the, these guys with money, honestly, do just control the world and we could just be living in some dystopian reality where we're in headsets. Yeah, even this could be a simulation. We wouldn't we wouldn't have an easy way of knowing, actually. There was, there's was. there been a lot of things on your TikTok about reality shifting, but I honestly don't know too much about it. Could you expand upon that for me? Yeah, so basically, so there's different types of... Uh, like definitions of reality shifting. It's also been called things like quantum jumping, quantum leaping. For me, what it is, is being able to shift our conscious attention to a version of reality different to this one, and then moving into that reality. There's different ways of doing that. And it gets very complicated when you bring in like timelines and the multiverse and things like that. So what I'm trying to do is shift towards just a very basic kind of definition of it where you just, similar to manifestation and, and law of attraction where you just decide on a reality you want to experience, a version of yourself, let's say, or um, a lifestyle, social circle, like something that you want to experience. And then you just kind of live in that, but in the present moment. So you just almost like you're not pretending, but you're kind of acting as if you're that person. And then those things will manifest in your life now. So, and I've, I've heard this from manifestation coaches and like all kinds of different uh, people who use manifestation. It's and I, So I think it is a real thing. Like I think you can change your reality in that way. 100%. And I, f I feel like um, where a lot of the people feel like um, the confusion comes from, like I feel like this is definitely a slow, gradual process. Like um, people who, uh, you know, start going, or oh, um, oh, if I just, you know, manifest, I'm going to be a billionaire, but you know, don't do anything about it and they've waited, you know, 10 days. Like, obviously it's not going to happen, but if you start at a point where you just might manifest in, you know, small amounts of money, like consistently, you will get to that point where eventually you have reality shifted into, you know, becoming a billionaire, but it, it, it's just a gradual and slow process that because mm. um, I, feel, I feel like a lot of um, this simulation the, w the way it works um, is you put something into the simulation you know through the choices that you make and then the, the, the matrix opens up doors for you and then um, but through going through more and more choices more and more do doors open for you within the simulation you know like we were saying before your free will expands for you to have more opportunities and more realities to shift to yeah exactly exactly i think what the problem is a lot of people don't decide what they actually want in their life so they they just kind of get drift they drift around get influenced by these different things society their friends parents media and then because they're not deciding what they want to experience they just experience kind of a bit of everything or what their parents tell them to or what society says they should do but then if you actually just stop that and decide what you want to experience like where you want your life to be what you want to do that you actually i feel like you actually have more control than you think about over that 100 percent. like it is cheesy but like genuinely in this world if you put your mind to it if you believe in anything like that is the age hold um like law of attraction whatever you believe comes to you isn't it like yeah and all possibilities are open in this world it's just about getting to that level of consciousness that you can achieve those dreams exactly